In my previous video tutorials, especially the first episode in the async series, we have talked about how in Dart, each thread is an isolate with its own memory and event loop. That means if intensive computations are performed on the same isolate as the Flutter engine, it might block Flutter rendering pipeline from executing important events on time, resulting in frames being dropped. It's important to reiterate, again, the async keyword in Dart does not automatically spawn a new thread. So writing async functions would not resolve any performance issues caused by heavy computations. Because code on the event queue are still executed in the same thread, a long-running task would block and delay the execution of all future tasks in both the event queue and the microtask queue. If you're still unclear about these topics, please watch my previous videos. So the way to do multi-threading in Dart is to spawn new isolates. In the current version of Dart, isolates cannot share memories with each other. So to get information across multiple isolates, we have to send messages between them. But don't let this discourage you from trying it out. In most cases, we can just offload a heavy task to the compute function to achieve multi-threading very easily. The compute function will help us spawn a new isolate, send the necessary data to the new isolate, run the time-consuming tasks, and eventually send the results back to the main isolate with very little code involved from our part. Let me demonstrate. Here I have opened up a new Flutter project. I've slightly modified the counter example to estimate the value of pi. I added a circular progress indicator here just to keep the app always animating, so it's easier for us to tell whether it's janky. And when the floating action button is pressed, we'll first clear any previous results by setting the variable pi to null, and then we'll call estimate pi function to compute pi. The function uses a horribly expensive way to compute pi. It's basically a very big for loop. The more terms it computes, the more accurate it gets. We'll just casually let it compute 1 billion terms for now. Once we get a result, we'll call set state and display it. Now let's press the button, and you can see a very noticeable freeze. The whole app becomes unresponsive for half a second. And when I press it again, the same thing happens. But did you notice that it did not even get a chance to clear the previous result? When the app was frozen, it did not display a null there. Why is that? Well, if you remember in the video where I talked about build context, we learned that set state actually just calls mark needs build method on the element, and that adds the dirty element to the list of widgets to be rebuilt in the next frame. But right here in this frame, we're not done yet. We'll be trapped in the time-consuming estimate pi function. So until that function finishes, Flutter won't even get a chance to build the next frame. When the computation finally finishes, the pi variable is set to the new result right away, again, before this frame ends. That's why we never see null being displayed on the screen. To further demonstrate this, let's add a delay here. Now when I press the button, we'll set the variable to null and use a set state call to mark this widget to be built in the next frame but we won't perform the heavy computation until one second later. So Flutter now has plenty of time to rebuild this widget and pump out a few more frames. So we can see the value now being displayed. But once it's eventually the turn to execute the heavy computation, it still runs on the same thread. So it blocks and delays other events and the app freezes again. Now let's see how easy it is to put this heavy work into a new thread with the compute function in Flutter. It has two requirements. First, the function call must be top level. That's easy, we can just move this function to be outside of any classes. And the second requirement is that the parameters and the function return values must be one of these sendable types. In our case here, parameter int and the return value double are both already sendable types, so we don't need to do anything special, they will work just fine. So for this example, it's as easy as calling compute, passing function and the parameter, and a wait for the result. Now let's run this app again. You can see that when I press the button, the app does not freeze anymore. If you need to send more complex data, a common way is to serialize them into either a list or a map, and then inflate them after sending, similar to the idea of transmitting JSON files over the internet. For example, in the sliding puzzle game I made recently, I implemented a naive approach of the breadth-first search algorithm to find an optimal solution for the game. A solution is typically found in 100 to 200 milliseconds, with some more difficult levels taking slightly longer. For a device that's running at 60 frames per second, a frame must be produced every 16 milliseconds, so a single computation taking over 100 milliseconds will surely result in jankiness in the app. To solve that, I use the compute function to run the algorithm in a new isolate. As you can see here, the solve function takes in a complex object of the type game state and returns a list of moves as a solution. Neither of these classes are directly sendable, so I chose to serialize them with the idiomatic toJSON and fromJSON methods. This way, what's being sent over to the new isolate is just a list of a map of strings and integers. It is a mouthful, but they are all sendable. In a puzzle game, this is used as a hint feature. Once the optimal solution is found, the game inserts an overlay on top of the piece that should move, and plays a short animation as a hint. 
To make an overlay land precisely on top of the piece, I used a composite transform fuller widget and layer links. I'll probably make a video tutorial on that topic next. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.